What's up, everybody? Back with another Bible study. Still here in the book of Hosea. Hosea chapter 10. Hallelujah. Israel is a luxuriant vine. And if you look up, look it up in the Hebrew, the word for luxuriant actually... It can mean luxuriant, but it can also mean make empty or fail, utterly make void. And uh, let me just continue on. I was going to go through some of the other scriptures regarding it, but uh. I'll just continue. Israel is a vine, a luxuriant vine or a empty vine because that's what we're going to see here in a minute. It's going to be made empty. Israel is a luxuriant vine. He produces fruit for himself. And this is speaking about believers. And this is what we've been seeing the whole time uh, throughout the book of Hosea. It's about, it's about believers mainly. And... Um, that's Israel. Judah is the Jews. This is Israel. Israel is a luxuriant vine. He produces fruit for himself. So the fruit is the people. Because God refers to people as uh, produce, as plants. And uh, this is what it's speaking about here. The fruit of the vine that is speaking about the vine is the basically Christianity, in other words, and the fruit is the believers, the individual believers. Israel is a luxuriant vine. He produces fruit for himself. The more his fruit, the more altars he made. And an altar, that's where worship takes place. And so the altars, in this case, is speaking about churches. But in other, in, uh, other chapters of Hosea, it was actually referencing the Christmas tree because that's where false worship takes place, at the Christmas tree, worshiping a false god, worshiping materialism and Santa Claus and the whole Christmas thing. And I just wanted to show you all the moon real quick. I just looked up here and, uh, see the moon and it actually is, it's crazy because you can see a, I mean, I guess that's just a camera and you see the outline around it. I guess it's just a camera. I'm not sure what else it would be, but, uh. So this is speaking about the churches. Israel is a luxuriant vine. He produces fruit for himself. The fruit is the believers, the, the people in the church. The more his fruit, the more altars he made, more churches, more places of worship. The richer his land, the better he made the sacred pillars. So the sacred pillars is also an object of worship. And... Uh, I do have a an article pulled up right here. It's off of HoshanaRaba.org, and that may be the same uh, as this YouTube channel I at least used to subscribe to. And the article is, it says, On Sacred Pillars, Steeples, Christmas Trees, and Easter Bunnies. And... Uh, It says, C.J. Coaster in his book, The Final Restoration, cites historical evidence relating these pillars to the Egyptian and Babylonian obelisk, which is connected to the sun worship and phallic symbol. So it's the obelisk that's, that's what we have in D.C. That's a national monument. The national monument. We see this in Egypt. We see this in, in Rome. And it's the same thing, basically, as the Christmas tree. It's the same 
It represents Nimrod's private part, the, the Baal, the Antichrist's private parts. And this is a tower in, in the middle of the capital of the United States. And, and many people just go there to look at it, not realizing what it really represents. Cites, cites historical re, uh, evidence for relating these pillars to the Egyptian and Babylonian obelisk, which was connected to sun worship in the phallic symbol. He states that these pillars were commonly erected at the entrance to pagan temples as fertility symbols in honor of the sun deity. Even as an Egyptian obelisk in this sort sits in the very center of the Catholic Church's St. Peter's Square in Rome, so, according to Coster, it is traditional for obelisk-shaped steeples to be found on Christian churches to this day, and this is where the steeples come from as well. It's all, I mean, it's just a tradition. People put steeples on a church for, for a tradition, not realizing it's all based on that. I mean, some may, but most have a steeple on a church, not realizing it's really based on what I just mentioned a minute ago. And this is these... uh pillars that it, that it speaks about. Give me one second. The more his fruit, the more altars he made. The richer his land, the better he made the sacred pillars. Their heart is faithless. Now they must bear their guilt. Yahuwah, the Lord, will break down their altars and destroy their sacred, sacred pillars. And there's coming a time soon when the world is going to turn on Christianity. The world is going to turn on the church. And we read in, I'll, I'll probably read the scripture here in a little bit. And hopefully I'm able to finish this video. It's in the 20s out here tonight. And I'm, it's freezing out here. Um, now to show you. 27 degrees. Getting down to 20 tonight. Their heart is faithless. Now they must bear their guilt. Yahuwah will break down their altars and destroy their sacred pillars. Speaking about the churches. And we know a strong persecution is coming upon the church here in these last days. And that's what causes the great falling away. See, the Antichrist is going to be revealed. And according to rabbi prophecies, it's potentially today or tomorrow. Um, the Antichrist is going to be revealed and there's going to be a... A turning, a true uh, turning against the people of God. Just to show you how cold it is, this is uh, ice on these uh, tote lids. Surely now they will say, speaking about believers, Surely now they will say, we have no king, for we do not revere the Lord, Yahuwah. As for the king, what, what can he do for us? And so who is the king? This is speaking about the, I believe this is speaking about the king of Israel. Not God, not Jesus, but the king of modern day Israel, the northern kingdom. Which would be the leader of America, Trump. Surely, now they will say, we have no king, for we do not revere Yahuwah. As for the king, what can he do for us? They speak mere words with worthless oaths. They make covenants, and judgment sprouts like poisonous weeds in the furrows of the field. And so, let me pull up a different translation on that. I have another translation pulled up on that. Let's see. 
the NIV reads, They make promises, take false oaths, make agreements, therefore lawsuits, or not, not lawsuits, judgment, the judgment of God, spring up like poisonous weeds in a plowed field. And that's the point of me reading this other scripture, a plowed field. The furrows are the fields. The furrows are like, like when, uh, like when you, basically, the trenches. Like when you're gonna plant seeds and you you dig the trenches, the individual trenches, and then plant the seeds and cover them. That's the furrows. So a plowed field is what I'm speaking about. And the field is the world. The plants are the people. So this is speaking about the judgment. Of the end and the, the the plants being torn up, and uh, they speak mere words with worthless oaths. They make covenants, and judgment sprouts like poisonous weeds in the furrows of the field. And the weeds, this is the thorns. This is speaking about poisonous weeds. This is the tares. Among the wheat, the false believers, the false Christians among the true ones, the poisonous weeds, because like I said, God refers to us as plants. And so the weeds are among the plants, but they're not the actual plants. The poisonous weeds, that's the false prophets, the false teachers, the false believers among the true ones. And judgment sprouts up. It says judgment sprouts like poisonous weeds in the furrows of the field. Because this is the judgment. The field is being plowed. And, um, and the, the poisonous weeds, the, the tares, the false believers among the true ones, the false prophets, the false teachers, false preachers, pastors, are a part of... Of this judgment of tearing up the the true people of God. And um, we saw this in the last chapter of Hosea. The inhabitants of Samaria will fear for the calf of Beth Avon. And this is the calf. And see, this is why it's related to Christmas time. This is all the judgment coming upon the believers is related to Christmas time. And this calf being in here in chapter 10 is why I wanted to go ahead and uh, part of the reason I wanted to go ahead and get into uh, Hosea 10 today. But uh, it was, it was God's will. But so. Give me one second. It says, one second, I think I accidentally closed uh, the chapter. I was closing some tabs. I have a lot of tabs open in regards to this chapter. Field is being, after the field has been plowed. The inhabitants of Samaria will fear for the calf of Beth Avon, and this wind chill is making it like 15 out here. The inhabitants of Samaria will fear for the calf, calf of Beth Avon. Indeed, so the calf, if if we go back two chapters in the book of Hosea, the calf. Is an object of worship. If this this relates back to the golden calf of uh, in Exodus, and with the golden calf, they the Israelites weren't trying to. They weren't actually worshiping the the calf. 
but they were using the calf as an object of worship, as as a uh, as a, as basically a representation of God. And in the same way, uh, Christian use, Christians use the Christmas tree as an object of worship regarding the birth of Jesus. The Christmas tree, and the Christmas tree goes back. You, you just have to look up my all, check out my video, Hanukkah, the Beast, and and Christmas. And it goes. The video goes into the origins of the Christmas tree, and we also see this in uh, Hosea chapter eight, I believe. For the inhabitants of Samaria will fear for the calf of Beth Avon. Indeed, its people will mourn over it. And its idolatrous, idolatrous priests will cry out over it, over its glory, since it has left it. And this is why I say, this is referencing this time of year. The calf, calf of Beth Avon. He's speaking about the Christmas tree. Its idolatrous priests will cry out, cry out over over its glory because because it has left it. The thing itself will be brought to Assyria. This is speaking about the United States, Assyria, as a gift of tribute to King Jareb. And this is speaking about Trump. And uh, it will be brought as a tribute to the to the president, this Christmas tree. And what do we see happening? Christmas tree delivered to the White House for 2020. One second. There's a couple of articles put up concerning this. And I mean, they do a whole ceremony pretty much to bring in the Christmas tree. This article uh, says the White House is continuing its holiday traditions this year despite the presidential transition that hangs in the balance as President Trump con continues to refuse the to concede the election. On Monday, the final Christmas tree of the Trump White House was delivered by horse-drawn carriage and presented to the First Lady Melania Trump outside of the official residence. And uh, I'm going to see that here. But since since when? Since when do you see? Do you really see presidents refusing to concede, refusing refusing to leave office and lose the election? This is because of the days we're living in. And Trump is going to be in office when it all goes down, whether that means in the next couple of weeks or he's going to stay in power. And uh, see this whole ceremony to bring in the Christmas tree. Bringing it in by a horse-drawn carriage. And I'll just stop it there. I would maybe take some more time on some of this stuff, but it's really freezing out here and I don't have gloves on um, I don't know how long I can do this video without my my hands uh, freezing
The inhabitants of Samaria will fear for the calf of Beth Avon. Indeed, its people will mourn over it. And as idolatrous priests will cry out over it, over its glory, since it has left it. The thing itself will be brought to Assyria as a gift to King Jerob. Ephraim will be seized with shame. And the gift to the King Jerob, the, the gift to the president, the Christmas tree. Ephraim will be seized with shame. And then Israel will be shamed of its own plan. And uh, I'm not sure exactly uh, because that's not happening right now. So, uh, like I always say, I don't have all these scriptures fi figured out. I'm just uh, going off with what God uh, gives me and and uh, this hasn't happened yet this year but uh, it's not over it's still Christmas Day technically right now um, Samaria will be destroyed with her king and Samaria represents the northern kingdom it's technically the capital of Ephraim. But Samaria, we know there was Judea, Judea and Samaria during the time of Jesus. And, Ju and Samaria represented, that was in the north. Um, so Samaria and Ephraim can be speaking about the same thing. Even though Samaria used to be the capital of Ephraim. Samaria will be destroyed with her king like a twig on the surface of the water. And like a twig on the surface of the water. And so the king of Samaria, that's the president. A twig on the surface of the water. A twig represents basically trees can represent um, either people or nations a twig on the surface of the water will be cut off like a twig on the surface of the water and we also know Babylon is said said to sit on many waters Babylon sits on many waters and also uh, in Jeremiah 50 or 51 I do have the scripture pulled up right now but I'm um, kind of trying to trying to hurry uh, let's see Jeremiah 51 42 says the sea has come up over Babylon she has been engulfed with its tumultuous tumultuous waves and it's speaking about the US Samaria will be destroyed with her king like a twig on the surface of the water Also, the high places of Avon, the sin of Israel, will be destroyed. And Avon, I did look up Avon. The high places of Avon, Strong's 205 in Hebrew, can mean the high places. And the high places represent places of worship. So the churches, speaking about the churches. The high places, the churches of affliction, evil, false, idol, iniquity, mischief, mourner, not. That's definitions for a Avon. So the churches involved in all that. And also the high places of Avon, the sin of Israel, will be destroyed. Thorns and thistles will grow on their altars. And again, thorns... And thistles. And speaking about demons. Speaking about Nephilim. Demons in the flesh. Who are. a lot. Of, I believe a lot of these false prophets are thorns. I mean. They're demons. They're Nephilim. And probably even fallen angels as well. Appearing as humans. And we read here in. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul makes a reference to this. I'm not going to go into a deep uh, study on this right now, but he says in verse, starting in verse 7, because of the extraordinary greatness of the revelations, for this reason to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, 
a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might leave me. And he has said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. So that was demonic oppression, the thorn in, in a flesh. Flesh represents our sinful nature, our, our carnal nature. Also, the high places of Avon, the sin of Israel, will be destroyed. The, the sinful churches, the wicked churches. Thorns and thistles will grow on their altars and their churches. I'm speaking about leaders of the church, which I just mentioned a second ago, which are actually, some of them, Nephilim, not even human. And people, uh, this, this goes down, this comes back to the whole rep Tillian thing and I, I said it the way I did because you know censorship and I normally just t say whatever but I normally don't talk about that and I know that type of stuff is uh, censored for sure even though my stuff is watched by the enemy constantly I know they listen to everything I say so it don't matter but Thorns and thistles will grow on our altars. Then they will say to the mountains, cover us. And to the hills, fall on us. So, so basically, so one more time. Also the high places of Avon, the Senate, so this is speaking about the days leading into the tribulation time. The last few days leading into the tribulation time. The high places of Avon, the sin of Israel will be destroyed. Thorns and thistles will grow on their altars. And which the same in in uh, if not even looking at it like uh, that thorns and thistles growing on altars. Basically, you could look at at it in in a different way as well. And um, actually, the Lord's leading me not to not to say this, but uh, I was thinking along the lines of never mind. Um, and it will say to the mountains, cover us, and the hills fall on us. And this is what we see in a sixth seal. So, let me just read this real quick. But from my understanding currently, the, the first five seals are open over, or the first six seals are open over uh, about a 10-day ten ten period. So, this is when the Antichrist is revealed. This is when... The basically aliens come down. This is when the fallen angels are cast to the earth, and likely as the aliens. Uh, I'm not. I'm not sure. I don't have it all figured out. Um, this is when the strong persecution of the church begins. Uh, the great falling away. The apostasy. The apostasy happens as the seals are being opened, and then at the sixth seal. And the fifth seal, we know that's the martyrs. At the sixth seal, and I looked when he broke the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth made of hair. And the whole moon became like blood. And the stars of the sky fell to the earth, as a fig tree drops its unripe figs when it's shaken by a great wind. The sky was split apart like a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth and the eminent people and the commanders and the wealthy and the strong and every slave and every free person hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the sight of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the land. For the great day of their wrath is come and who is able to stand? So it's a sixth seal reference here in Hosea 10. One second. And they will say to the mountains, cover us, and, and the hills fall on us. Since the days of Gibeah you have sinned, Israel. And Gibeah, that's when, back in the book of Judges, when uh, the guy traveled to a city, the city of Gibeah, and it was, uh, it was full of the Benjamites, the tribe of Benjamin. 
and uh, basically they raped his uh, his concubine, his woman, and killed him and killed her, and then he cut her up in, into twelve pieces and sent her throughout Israel as basically, I guess, a sign of the wickedness that, that they just did. And uh, that's Gibeah. So since the days of Gibeah, you have sinned, Israel. There they stand. In other words, they're still in Gibeah. They're still in that place. They're still in that sinful lifestyle. Since the days of Gibeah, you have sinned, Israel. And there they stand, or there they remain. Will the battle against the sons of injustice overtake them in Gibeah? Or not overtake them in Gibeah? So basically, I mean, I was looking at this a few minutes ago in a different translations, which I have pulled up, but I'm kind of trying to hurry because my hands are uh, really freezing. Since uh, it says, will the battle against the sons of injustice not overtake them in Gibeah? So in other words, just as the, the people of Israel, the, the Benjamites, were were ended up be, being destroyed by the rest of Israel for their sin in Gibeah. It's basically saying, will that not happen again? You're still in Gibeah. You remained in that state. And God's saying, you remained in this sin. Will evil not overtake you again? Will judgment not overtake you again like it happened before? When it is my desire, I will discipline them. And the peoples will be gathered against them. When they are bound for their double guilt. For their double guilt. And uh, the double is mentioned a few times. And we know this is speaking about Ephraim. Speaking about believers and speaking about the United States. Because... As I always say, uh, where there's a people, there's a land, and they're always tied together. So, one second. So, Revelation 18, verse 6. Pay her back, speaking about Babylon, speaking about the United U.S., pay her back even as she is paid, and give her double according to her deeds. And the cup which she has mixed, mixed twice as much for her. And, you know, some a lot of people, you know, different people claim, and you see, a lot of people are right on certain aspects of who Babylon is, because, as I just said, where there's a people, there's a land, where there's a land, there's a people. And so Babylon... The original harlot is uh, Israel and is made up of the two daughters. The, the mother is made up of the two daughters, which is uh, modern-day Israel and modern-day America. And But it's, uh, it's not the land, it's not the land mass that rebelled against, against God and played the harlot. It was the people. So the land of the people is going to be destroyed and the people is going to be destroyed. You know, it's... Uh, it's both. Pay her back even as she has paid. Give her back double according to her deeds. And the cup which she has mixed, mixed, mixed twice as much for her. And we re read here in Isaiah 40 verse 2. Because Jerusalem is also, modern day Israel is also part of Babylon. Speak kindly to Jerusalem and call out to her. That her warfare has ended, that her iniquity has been removed, that she has received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. When it is my desire, I will discipline them, and the peoples will be gathered against them when they are bound for their double, double guilt. Ephraim is a trained heifer that loves to thresh. And the threshing is, uh, I actually have the definition pulled up, so let me just look it up real quick. Thresh. 
fresh. Because this has to do with, uh, let's see. To separate seed from a harvested plant. Also to, and, but one of the definitions here is, uh, to strike repeatedly. And so the threshing, on the threshing floor, they used to use animals and stuff to, to stomp on the grain, to, uh, to separate the grain from the stalk of the wheat. And so it involves, as, as we just read, uh, to strike repeatedly. And this is what we saw concerning, um, concerning the, the false prophets, how they're, they're continually striking the people of the church, how they're basically destroying the people of the church through these false doctrines. It says, Ephraim is a trained heifer that loves to thresh. Trained, because a lot of these people are, you know, trained. A lot of these people are hired to do the things they do. A lot of these people are, you know, false prophets. A lot of these people are trained by men and not by the Holy Spirit. Trained by traditions of men to teach the things they do. Trained by even some of them government agencies. Even some of them the devil himself to, to teach the things that they do. Because... Uh, you know, there's many tares among the wheat. There's many false believers and false teachers, false pastors, false preachers, false prophets among the true ones. Many wolves among the sheep. Ephraim is a trained heifer that, heifer that loves to thresh. And it says, I pass, And I passed over her lovely neck. I will harness Ephraim. Judah will plow. Jacob will harrow for himself. And harrow is... Uh, I do have the definition of harrow pulled up as well. So Judah will plow, and remember the field, that's the world, and the, the plants. So plowing is digging up the plants, tearing up the plants, which is the people. Judah will plow, and Ephraim will harrow, or Israel will harrow, speaking about Ephraim, the northern kingdom. And harrow, the definition is an impl implement consisting of heavy frames set with teeth or tines, which is dragged over or plowed, Drag over plowed land to break up clods, remove weeds, and cover seed. So it's a... Uh, it has to do with plowing. It's uh, to remove weeds and cover seed and to... Drag over plowed land. So that's interesting. But I believe this is speaking about... Let's see. Let's get back over here. Ephraim is a trained heifer who loves to, loves to thresh. And I passed over her lovely neck. Uh, so, and then it says, I will harness Ephraim. Because they're already stomping, basically stomping on, as I just mentioned a minute ago, they're crushing their congregations. They're destroying them. Um... Striking repeatedly to use false doctrines and everything. It says, but he says, I will harness Ephraim. Judah will plow. Jacob will harrow for himself. And which, like I said, the, the plowing has to do with uh, tearing up the ground tearing up the plants that are in the ground and the harrowing is similar removing the weeds which is uh, the false believers that's the tares the false believers among the true ones and I believe this is a, a reference to the 144,000 we read here in in Zechariah chapter 9 I mean, it's freezing out, out here. Who, who is walking down the street right now? 
and laughing at me. Like, seriously. One second. I'm going to just start here uh, in verse 11 in Zechariah chapter 9. As for you also, because of the blood of the covenant with blood of my covenant with you, I have set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. So that's the resurrection. Return to the stronghold, you prisoners who have the hope. Have the hope in Jesus. Return to the stronghold. That's heaven. This very day I am declaring that I will restore double to you. And the same day that uh, double is being... Double punishment is coming on some. Double blessing is coming on others. Because some, and, and this goes down to, it just made me think about how some people aren't even going to die. Some people are going to be raptured and not even taste death. But on the other hand, some people are going to die once and then die again in a lake of fire the second death but it says for I will bend Judah as my bow I will fill the bow with Ephraim and I will stir up your sons O Zion speaking about the sons of the kingdom us the, the believers 144,000 more be more specific and I will make you like a warrior sword or I will stir up your sons O Zion against your sons O Greece speaking about the people of this world, more specifically America. And I will make you like a warrior sword. Then Yahuwah will appear over them. Jesus will appear over them. And his arrow will go forth like the lightning. And the Lord God will blow the trumpet and march in the strong winds of the south. The Lord of armies will protect them and they will devour and trample on sling stones. They will drink and be boisterous as with, with wine. They will be filled with a sac like a sacrificial basin. Drenched like the corners of the altar, and the Lord their God will save them on that day, as the flock of his people. For they are like precious stones of a crown. And that's a reference to uh, Revelation 12. The crown, the twelve stars over the head uh, of the woman that's uh, representing the twelve tribes of the 144,000. And so back here to Hosea 10. And this is one of the more difficult chapters to understand here in Hosea. Ephraim is like a trained heifer that loves to thresh. And I passed over her lovely neck. I will harness Ephraim and Judah will plow and Jacob will, or Israel will harrow for himself. But, but it says, speaking to us now, speaking to the believers, the Christians, Christians now, sow for yourselves with a view to righteousness, meaning preach repentance. So the, the sowing, if we go over here to Luke 8, verse 11, it says, now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. So that's what we're sowing, the seed. We're sowing the word of God into the hearts of the people. And it says, Sow for yourselves with a view to righteousness. With a view to righteousness. So preach repentance. Preach people to not only to believe, but to turn from their sins. That 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 we need to turn from our sins to, to God for the forgiveness of our sins. Not, sim not simply believe as much, most of a lot of Christianity just preaches. Simply believe. Believe Jesus died for your sins and you'll be saved. But it's about turning to God for the salvation of our sins. What do we turn to Jesus for? For the salvation, for the forgiveness of our sins. Saved from the death. Because... Our sin results in death. That's permanent death of body and soul. And we turn to Him for the forgiveness of our sins so we can live. 
and it is by believing that we're saved, but but we got to repent too. We got to make that decision to turn to Jesus for the salvation of our souls, for the forgiveness of our sins. Sow for yourselves with with a view to righteousness. Harvest, and actually, I don't know why it's pulled up in a different translation right now. Oh, uh, I don't know how that happened. Um, sow with a view to righteousness. Reap in accordance with kindness. So we, we sow the the word of God into the hearts of the people. And the reaping is uh, actually bringing people to salvation. But reaping also is... Uh, and the harvest is uh the angels do the reaping. So this is speaking I mean speaking about something different than that. But in the harvest the angels do the reaping, meaning reaping us from the earth. The earth is uh the field and they reap we're, we're the plants, the angels reap us from the earth into his kingdom. But in this case it's speaking about uh bringing people bringing people into the kingdom. The the sowing is just the preaching of the word of God but the reaping is the bringing people say bringing people to salvation basically so with a view to righteousness reap in accordance with kindness break up your fallow ground and fallow ground I uh, one second I did look that up as well land was allowed to lie fallow that it might become more fruitful. When in this condition, it soon became overgrown with wo- with thorns and weeds. The cultivator of the soil was careful to break up its fallow ground and clear it from the weeds before sowing, sowing seed in it. So break up your fallow ground. Sow with a view to righteousness. Reap in accordance with kindness. Break up your fallow ground. For it is time to seek the Lord. Basically get rid of the the things that are holding you back. The weeds. Which is also, you know, like I said, a reference to demons and false prophets. Break up your fallow ground. For it is time to seek Yahuwah. Until he comes to rain righteousness on you. For you, you have plowed, or depending on translation, planted, because this is in, in contrast with sowing with a view to righteousness and reaping in accordance with kindness. It's saying, do this. It says, but you have, you have plowed or sown wickedness and reaped injustice. You have eaten the fruit of lies because you trusted in your way. And your numerous warriors, so in reference to the church, and speaking about our nu- the numerous believers, the numerous pastors, you have trusted in your own way and, and your many people to get the job done rather than true righteousness and God getting the job done through the Holy Spirit. But in reference to Ephraim, because Ephraim can also represent the United States as, as a land, think about the, the U.S., You have trusted in your numerous warriors. The U.S. trusted in its numerous warriors. Therefore, a tumult will arise among your people. And all your fortresses will be destroyed. So we're going to write the U.S. But also the believers. Because we know the churches are going to be destroyed. And this is what we saw earlier in the chapter. As Sharm, as Shalman destroyed Beth Arbel... On the day of battle. And I didn't look up those. Two specifically to figure that out. As Sharman destroyed Beth Arbel. In the day of battle. When mothers. Were dashed in pieces. With their children. And. Uh, that is also. Reference to. Uh, referred to. In reference to, to Babylon. We read in Psalm 137, verse 8. O daughter of Babylon, you devastated one. How blessed will be the one who repays you with the recompense of which, with which you have repaid us. How blessed 
will be the one who seizes and dashes your little ones against the rock. And we read here in uh, Isaiah verse 13, which is also about Babylon. Anyone who is found will be thrust through, and anyone who is captured will fall by the sword. Their little ones will also be dashed to pieces before their eyes. Their houses will be plundered. And their little ones, their children, can also be referenced to, uh, as we saw in the last chapter of Hosea, um, can be a reference to the, the people of the church, the children of the church, the product of the church. Basically, the congregation. And here in Hosea chapter 13, um, I don't know why the, the page isn't pulling up, but Hosea 13 makes the same uh, reference that the children, children and being dashed against the rock or dashed to pieces uh, in reference to Samaria. And that's the United States. Speaking about the United States. But back here to Hosea 10. I just got a lot of pages pulled up. One second. Thus it will be done to you at Bethel because of your great wickedness. That's what would be done to you at Bethel. And speaking about uh, the church, speaking about believers. <laughs> but um, also can be referencing uh, the, the land of the believers, which is uh, speaking about the U.S. Because this is where most of Christianity comes from. This is where it's believed a lot of the ten tribes which also represents prophetically Christians. A lot of the ten tribes were believed to move to the United States uh, hundreds of years ago. Thus it will be done to you at Bethel, and Bethel means the house of God. Thus it will be done to you at Bethel, at the house of God, because of your great wickedness. And this is what we saw in the last chapter of Hosea, how... how... Uh, Believers are going to be um, betrayed. How there's many false prophets, false um, teachers, false preachers, workers of the enemy who are going to betray their congregations here in these last days. It's going to happen. And, um, and this is why I believe this is why, I mean, I believe this is, this is what God tells us in the last chapter of Hosea, in Hosea chapter 9. And this is the reason for the churches being broken up here in these last days. The church is not being able to gather um, in order that they won't be all just completely... I believe the plan of the enemy was originally to just invade all the churches and take all the believers, you know? But God did. God broke up the churches. Even though many of them weren't true believers, as we know, many of the people in church aren't true believers. But God uh, broke up that plan. But it's still going to happen. And in some some cases, this will be done to you at Bethel, house of God, because of the because of your great wickedness. And house of God also just represents believers in general. That's the house of Israel. Um, the house of God is his people. We are the house of God. God dwells in us, his temple. We are the temple of God as individual believers, individual temples that make up the whole temple, whole house of God. That's what will be done to you at Bethel because of your great wickedness. At dawn, the king of Israel, this is speaking about the president, at dawn, the king of Israel will be completely cut off, which means killed. At dawn. Now, I guess whether that just means evening or... I mean, I, I guess it's just a reference to at evening, at dawn.
maybe Dawn reference is a reference to other things and I don't think it's a coincidence people out here just making all kind of noise I mean who's out who's just out here walking around on the streets uh, in 25 degrees coming by laughing at me multiple times you know so it is what it is man maybe it's a coincidence but But anyway, anyway, that's it. That's the end of a uh, Hosea ten, and this is still gonna happen. You know, the enemy is coming against the house of God. We see this in many scriptures. We've seen seen this about. I mean, this is what the whole book of Hosea is about, about how judgment is gonna come against the believers, come against the house of God here in these last days, and God gives us different aspects of it, uh, why it's gonna happen. Uh, how it's going to happen, um, how it, it was attempted to happen. And we see that in the last chapter. Um, it's because the people of God have left following God, left truly following God. And um, in many ways, people place so much focus on Christmas and hardly any attention on God. And Christmas, we know, we see is uh, based on, I mean, December 25th is Nimrod's birthday. I mean, Nimrod is Baal, the Antichrist. I mean, this ain't an accident. People coming by making this much noise. Come on, man. But, uh... I mean, they're only making that much noise right when they come uh, in front of my house. But whatever. Probably paid to do so. Wouldn't surprise me. Could just be some young kids acting up, but why are they only making noise when they're in front of my house? They got quiet after they passed. You know? But whatever. But uh, judgment's coming to the house of God. Judgment begins in the house of God. We know from scripture. And and uh, like I said, the, Ho the book of Hosea has been showing us in many ways how this is, uh, how this is gonna happen, why this is gonna happen. is because of false teachers, false doctrines, People being led astray, people not truly following God, people being caught up in in holidays, stuff, the ways of the world, being caught up in Christmas, the things of the world, focusing on that rather than focusing on God, and we see that judgment judgment's coming to the to the people of God. Judgment is coming to the church. This is all throughout the. This is what Hosea is telling us, how judgment is coming to the church, and how and how all. Uh, and how, how we saw, like I said, that we saw in the last chapter of Hosea, how um, basically they they were planning on setting up, um, basically planning on taking people down, taking their churches down, basically. No, I just don't. Uh, you know, there's certain churches that have security, and how how do you know? And what if that security ends up being actual enemies? And they're, they're ar armed already. Once people come into the church, they're already there armed. You know? And, you know, it's a... But it's crazy, man. But I believe this is part of the reason why, uh, as we saw in the last chapter, that, that God shut down the churches this year. It wasn't necessarily the enemy that shut that had them shut down because God is in control of everything he had it done 
we see we saw that in the last chapter of Hosea, chapter nine. But uh, but chapter ten was uh, a little bit more difficult than some of the chapters to to explain and go through. But uh, I believe God uh, revealed what He needed to reveal in this and showed me what He or spoke through me what he, what he needed to speak through me. You know, I'm. I mean, I'm not claiming to be a prophet. I'm not claiming to be anything, but but I ask God that I ask God the opposite that that I won't be, and that I'm only going to speak His word if I'm going to speak it in truth, you know. And I just ask Him to speak through me. So, I mean, if I'm wrong on anything, that's that's my that's my fault. But I do know He speaks through me. He gives me understanding on a lot of these scriptures. And um, all glory to him. I don't want any glory. I don't want any praise. It's his word, his praise. He deserves it all. I don't deserve anything. I don't want anything. I'm nothing. I'm just a vessel. All glory to God. Praise to him. Praise be to him. So let's be prepared, brothers and sisters. Judgment is coming to us. Judgment begins in the house of God. It begins with believers. And... Um, we know in the last days, uh, I can't remember now if I read this earlier or not, but I do have it pulled up, at least did earlier. We know from Matthew 24, starting in uh, verse 9, Then they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you, and you will be hated by all nations because of my name. And at that time, Many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. See, this is when the apostasy happens, the great falling away happens. Um, this is, from my current understanding, the last 10 days before the tribulation time begins. Unless, uh, I mean, this is my current understanding. Then they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you, and you will be hated by all nations because of my name. And at that time, many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and will mislead many. Because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold. And But the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations. And then the end will come. And... Yeah, I mean, like I said, that's my current understanding. I believe... Uh, So the last 10 days leading up to the tribulation times and leading up to the last seven years. But, uh, yeah, it's my understanding. Um, but let's be ready, brothers and sisters. Let's be ready for whatever. Let's be ready for whatever may come upon us here in these last days. Let's overcome. Let's walk in all his ways. Let's endure to the end no matter what. No matter what. Beware of false doctrines. Beware of false teachers. There's many out here. There's many tares among the wheat. There's many wolves among the sheep. And as we see, again, here in Hosea, God likens us to the plants. And this is a big part of understanding Scripture. But uh, let's be ready. Let's spread the gospel. Let's warn the people of the coming judgment. Let's warn the church of the coming judgment on the church. That's, uh, but most of all, let's preach righteousness. Let's make sure we're walking on in all His ways. Let's make sure we're heart, our heart is pure. Let's make sure we're walking in, in His ways fully. And and preach the same thing to ever, other believers to do the same. And let's preach, preach the gospel to the world. Let's shine His light. It shine, we shine His light by preaching the gospel. by Because Jesus is the light of the world. We shine His light by keeping His commandments. Because His law is light. His commandments are light. Let's show his love in everything we do. Let's uh, be ready and do everything we can for the kingdom while we have a chance. And if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, call out to him today. We're living in the last days. Not much time left. And Jesus loves you and he wants to save you. 2020 was not an accident, not a coincidence. We're living in the last days according to the Bible and it's about to go down before long. Maybe in the next couple weeks, next couple months. I don't think we have a couple years left. 
until everything happens, meaning the wrath of God is coming upon this world. Satan is going to have his reign here. The Antichrist is going to appear. And billions of people are going to die. And it's going to come out of nowhere, too. No one's going to be expecting it. It's just going to happen. It's going to happen, and it's going to be over for many people. So give your life to Jesus Christ. It's only through Jesus that we have eternal life. See, God requires perfection in order to enter his kingdom, in order to live forever. And none of us are perfect. We all sin and fall short of the glory of God. We can't earn our way to heaven. We can't earn our way to eternal life. It's only through faith in Jesus because, because we can't earn it. We can't, do, can't work our way to heaven. We can't work our way to eternal life. And that's why Jesus came. Jesus was born as a human, lived a perfect life, did nothing wrong. And in his perfection, he took on the punishment for us, made the sacrifice for us. So that through faith in him and what he did on the cross, we have our sins wiped away. If you believe Jesus died for your sins, and you call out to him and ask him to forgive you for your sins, ask him to save you, he will. He'll give you the Holy Spirit as a promise until the day he comes, until the day he brings us into his kingdom. And he'll give you eternal life. Never die again. Never die eternal life in a new body that doesn't die a new spirit body like the angels like Jesus so give your life to Jesus Christ today we're living in the last days it's only through faith in him and what he did on the cross that we can be saved it's only through him and what he did so repent and believe the gospel the word repent just means to have a change of mind or change of heart deciding to truly turn to God that's repent Repent and believe the gospel. We're living in the last days. There's not much time left. Thank you guys for tuning in. Love y'all. Shalom.